We are very glad to have your company tonight on Rwanda Television and News. Thank you very much for keeping us uh, company. And uh, welcome to our tonight's edition. We'll start it off with what makes up our top stories. The National Commission for Human Rights has called on responsible authorities to set up efforts in reducing overcrowding in Rwandan prisons. Some of uh, the traders in the city of Kigali have embarked on working for many night hours in order to help residents access goods and services. They Once again, a very good evening to you from wherever you are joining us from. Thank you very much for joining us. My name, as always, is Sam Kalisa. And mine, Martina Vera. How are you doing, Martina? I'm very good. How are you, Sam? Very, very great. Good to be with you again. Yes, so we'll start it off on the local scene. Yes, uh, the National Commission for Human Rights has called on responsible authorities to step up efforts to reduce congestion in prisons uh, in Rwanda, which is mainly caused uh, by the delay in the trial of uh, criminal suspects. The commission echoes MPs' concern that there are still other issues that need a lasting solution. We have more on this report. The chairperson of the National Commission for Human Rights, Murungi Providence, told MPs the progress that have been made in respect of human rights at various levels. However, there are still gaps and areas that need urgent action, including congestion in Rwandan prisons. There is a total of 86,274 people in all correctional centers. Despite the facilities capable of harboring 61,300 people, hence the 140% capacity rate. One of the reasons for the increase in prison overcrowding is the delay in the trial of those suspected of various crimes. Congestion is also still an issue in psychiatric hospitals like the Ndera Psychiatric Teaching Hospital. There is also an issue of overcrowding in temporary holding facilities. The leading are the Risororo that had 360 people, the Nyagatare one, Chiramurizi, Jichumbi, Gwezamenyo, Chigabiro, Chirehe, Rukara, Nyama, and Nzige. Those are 10 out of 100 facilities that were inspected that are overcrowded. In addition to emerging issues includes the problem of young children that are held in prison together with their mothers without access to special meals as well as medical insurance and lack of medical care for the disabled and the elderly. Deputies and senators suggested solutions for some of these issues. I want to know if the commission has information why is the food not transferred to the temporary holding facilities where prisoners are taken before going for trial for a specific period? Yet, it is clear that they have to take certain types of food. The commission visited various refugee camps, correctional centers, institutions, and families that help young children, as well as transit camps. In each of these institutions, human rights were properly respected despite a few issues that need urgent action and response. Refugees and immigrants who have been hosted by Rwanda affirm that Rwanda is a safe place to reside in and understands the pain of those who are in danger. We do have the details with Adam Squizera. The government of Rwanda says that the history that made many of its residents find themselves in a refugee life is one of the reasons why the country feels responsible to host asylum seekers. In various refugee camps across the country, you find the refugees from neighboring countries, especially those from the Democratic Republic of Congo, including those who've been in these camps for almost 25 years ago, and Burundians who've been there for more than eight years. <laughs> We get a capital from Ingomoko, which provided us loans to start small businesses, which literally assisted us to develop ourselves in these camps. These fundings also helped me in raising my capital as well. Apart from hosting the refugees from neighboring countries, the government of Rwanda has also pledged to help those who have been oppressed for a long time in Libya trying to migrate to European countries, whereas since 2019, Rwanda has shown its interest in solving the issue of migrants, including those who have been abused or taken hostage while trying to cross the Mediterranean Sea. 
Gabriel Mariam Janwali Gemai from Ethiopia fled to Libya where her hope was laid to cross the Mediterranean Sea from Libya to Europe illegally. She says that the life they were living at that time with her husband in Libya was miserable but later they were brought to Rwanda. Within two years living in Rwanda, Gabriel Mariam has given birth to a child. I don't know what to say but life in Libya was really miserable. In Rwanda, especially here in the camp, we live well, life is good because we are taken care of in many ways, which means that we are good in this place. Rwanda is one of the countries on the African continent that has shown its uniqueness in various programs that are dedicated to help refugees and migrants in finding asylum and integrating the society, as well as providing them a safe space to reside. This is affirmed by some of the students came to continue their studies in Rwanda through the partnership with the University of Medical Sciences and Technology UMIST, where the students have fled from fighting that are still ongoing between the state forces and the Rapid Support Forces, RISF. A 22 years old, Umna Abubakar and Muhammad Amar are among of 160 students that were received by the University of Rwanda in that program. Both appreciate the way they have received by the government of Rwanda. What they say is mostly based on the security they have, which makes Umna Abubakar think about even staying in Rwanda. Uh, this is a very great, wonderful opportunity uh, that other, a lot of other universities didn't get the chance to have and we're very lucky to have get this experience and come here to Rwanda. Um, so we're very grateful for it and uh, <laughs> we hope to continue here and finish the, whatever we have rest. Everything is like uh, very organized and people are so helpful here and it's quite something I really appreciate uh, as a foreigner. I've never met any difficulties in, in dealing with local people. One of the problems faced by Rwanda after the genocide against Tutsi was the resettlement of refugees and the establishment of a system that allows those refugees to live well with the local residents in the country. Adam Squizera, RTV News. Thank you, Adams, for that report. Now, some traders in the city of Kigali have embarked on working many night hours in order to help residents have access to goods and services that they need. We have more on this report. At 2 a.m., as we arrived at Nyarujenje Market, we found clerks who were busy at work loading goods into trucks and taking them to the warehouse. From there, we continued to various car washes and we found people working. I am not ashamed of my work because I have been working for 23 years. I start at 6 p.m. in the evening and conclude at 2 in the morning. I came as a young man and I have a family of five children and a wife. I charge 3,000 per car and I pay 1,500 for taxes and remain with the rest. This radical job does not require a lot of food. But to do it, it requires experience, because we have eaten a lot and fame. I am 52 years old, but I carry 125 or 100 kilos. Among the activities that are carried out at night in Kigali City include the processing of animal products, so that restaurants and hotels can get what they use in preparing meals. It is around 3 in the morning in Nyabugogo Battery. Olivier Mbabazi works there. Here in Nyabugogo Battery, formerly called the Provi, now called Saban, we batch goats and sheep. Our work of battery cows starts at 2 a.m. We can batch between 150 to 200 cows. After battering them, we put them in cold rooms for 24 hours and then we go to the market. To then, afterwards, we substitute them with the ones that we batch at night. Nyabugogo Market, also known as Kwamutangana, is commonly known for the availability of vegetables on the market. Most of the sellers are women. We reached at the market around 4 a.m. and talked to vendors. I wake up and carry three or four bags of French beans and earn four to three thousand. At 8 a.m., I take my child to school. You prepare and get up at 12. You get here at 1 a.m. so that you can get the products. As of now, I give 2,100 per day in the saving group. After three months, we will buy clothes 
a pay school fees for children. The capital city of Rwanda, Chigali, has a population of about 1,745,555 people, approximately to 13.2% of all Rwandans. This number is added on the commuters and those who work in various jobs in the suburbs. In order to provide services to the residents and commuters of the city, there are those who work while others sleep to make life better. Various uh, stakeholders in uh, modern urbanization, such as uh, designers, urban planners, uh, financiers, uh, builders, as well as uh, policymakers, have uh, met under one roof in Kigali for a three day summit on Africa's new cities. The intention is to brainstorm on how to uh, best plan for urbanization ahead of uh, a time to avoid challenges that often arise uh, on uh, the African continent, according to Dr. Mark Luther. And and uh, Curtis Lockhart uh, from uh, the uh, Charter of Cities Institute. And so we have the data. We can proactively project where they are expanding to, and therefore we can in install infrastructure for that city well in advance of settlement. And that makes it a lot cheaper. It makes it, therefore, I think it's five to seven times cheaper than if you were retroactively applying uh, infrastructure. And that's what we're about. It's not necessarily completely new cities. It's anticipating the direction of urbanization and proactively installing urban infrastructure in advance of settlement. It's been a pleasure uh, hosting this summit in Kigali, Rwanda. I think Kigali being here the last week setting up for the summit, Kigali shows how to get urbanization right. I think Kigali can stand as a model for urban development for the entire continent and that's one of the main reasons we decided to host this summit here in Kigali with the Rwanda Development Board. So I would say thank you to Kigali, thank you to Rwanda and thank you to our co-hosts at the RDB. When we think about new cities at the Charter Cities Institute, what we think about is how to make them um, uh, work for the average resident. So how do you create educational opportunities? How do you create job opportunities? How do you attract investment? How do you attract businesses? But at the Charter Cities Institute, we think about how to build these cities for the average resident, for the person who's moving from a farm to a city, for the, the, the working family that wants to get make sure their kids get a good education. Right? How do you build and design cities for these people? Um, and that's, that's really what our focus is. Hearing the last conversation from Curtis, we're really excited that Rwanda um, is hosting us and we think they're an excellent partner um, in figuring out urbanization in Rwanda and hopefully also figuring out how to create successful urban strategies for um, the rest of Africa. And uh, during uh, the summit, discussions are centered on digitizing uh, city services and e-governance in uh, new cities, serving the most on uh, migration, security and affordability of basic needs in new cities. Over to you, Martina. The Kaspersky Digital Company launched its first transparency center in the African region based in Kigali, Rwanda. This is part of the Kaspersky's Global Transparency Initiative, established to highlight the reliability of the company's solutions and enhance transparency advocacy throughout the cybersecurity industry. In an exclusive interview with our colleague Prince Manzi, the head of the Global Research and Analysis Team, Amin Hasbini, dives into topics ranging from the cyber security, the establishment of this center, and why Rwanda was chosen as the host. Thank you for having your time here with us. Thank you. Uh, what would you say are the common threats and the regions where they are, they are found uh, based on the statistics you have? Um, there are different uh, threats that target uh, um, African users and organizations. Uh, there are the normal threats, like regular threats that target home users, for example, to steal data, to maybe uh, uh, do ransomware, for example, or, or to blackmail the, the home user, etc. Though we are also tracking a lot of advanced attacks happening in Africa, targeting large organizations, governmental entities, sometimes industrial organizations as well. And, and these attacks are the most advanced. They use... Uh, very sophisticated technologies sometimes in order to achieve uh, their objectives. You are launching the new uh, transparency center in the African region, specifically here in Kigali, Rwanda. Uh, what are the benefits of it and how will it perform? 
So uh, the center is indeed uh, based in Kigali. Uh, Rwanda has proven itself to be a regional hub for uh, uh, different economic and legal activities in the region. And uh, with this, uh, we have decided to uh, deploy our transparency center here. Uh, this will allow us to uh, demonstrate uh, transparently the code of our products to uh, special entities in the region, legal and governmental, and to for our trusted partners to be able to verify uh, uh, the code that we have and uh, that is being shared with customers and organizations. Now, what would you say are the benefits that Africans and Rwandans specifically will gain from this center? I think uh, this transparency center allows to enhance trust uh, between uh, Kaspersky and the African and Rwandan market. And I think what is uh, uh, very important here is that um, this, this trust uh, goes beyond what is usually offered by technology vendors. Here, access to intellectual property and code is available, and that allows for uh, going beyond the boundaries of uh, uh, the usual levels of trust, mainly because uh, uh, as, a, as a foreign uh, technology vendor coming from outside uh, Africa, Kaspersky permits itself to uh, be trusted better than other vendors and, and uh, uh, via transparency centers that allow to verify actually what, what Kaspersky uh, can do and how it does it. You do realize that we have a, a limited market ready skills uh, in cybersecurity in the region, what are the best models to bridge this gap? I think uh, it's important to to uh, um, like I've I've, I've uh, communicated with some colleagues and the community here a little bit around around Rwanda, and I am aware of uh, different initiatives that allow for the development of um, uh, technology skills in inside the country, uh, specifically programming and coding. And, and uh, these, these kinds of initiatives are usually very well supported by private and public entities. Uh, at Kaspersky, we are also participating in, in some of these initiatives as well globally, which allow to enhance, uh, from one side, the skills of uh, users and students uh, uh, in, in universities sometimes. However, it also allows to <clears throat> for the sharing of intelligence, sharing of uh, uh, the different um, details about what uh, cybersecurity has evolved to become, uh, the new technologies used in defense for users and organizations at home or in, in, in uh, organizations of small or large size. This was an exclusive interview with uh, Amil Hasbin, the head of global research and uh, analysis team at the Kaspersky. I'm Prince Manzi. This is our TV news. And that's all for us here at uh, RBA's Rwanda Television News. On behalf of the entire news production, as well as the technical team, many thanks for being with us. My name is Tessa Samkalisa. And my Martin Herrera. And we'll say up until next time. Stay safe. And have a great evening.